and this bacteria goes 60 miles an hour. That little motor is so tiny, if you took a hair off your head and cut it off, you could put 8 million of those motors on the stump of that hair. And it turns 100,000 RPM. Had to be designed, folks. Now, if you want to believe it happened by chance, you go ahead and believe that. But that's not logical, and it's not science. Now, this textbook says the complex structure of the human eye may be the product of millions of years of evolution. Well, again, they're welcome to believe that, but the eyeball is incredibly complicated. Darwin knew the eyeball was complex and said it gave him a headache. Darwin said, to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd. By the way, how can blind chance make a seeing eye? Hmm? <laughs> On the back of your eyeball, you have about one square inch called the retina. In that one square inch, there are 137 million light-sensitive cells, all of them wired to the brain. I've done quite a bit of building in my life. I've hooked up quite a few electrical wires. Can you imagine wiring an eye with 137 million connections in one square inch? My Heavenly Father did it. He's pretty smart, ain't he? I debated an atheist in uh, New York. He said, I've got proof for evolution. The human eye is poorly designed. I said, why do you say that? He said, well, the light comes into the eye, and then at the back, when it, before it hits the retina, it goes through blood vessels. And the blood vessels block part of the light. He said, the octopus has a much better eye because their blood vessels are behind the retina. Humans have blood vessels in front of the retina. That's a poor design. He said, that's proof for evolution. I said, well, wait, wait. First of all, poor design is not proof for evolution, OK? Porsche designed a car one year. They accidentally made it where you had to jack up the motor to change the spark plugs. That's a poor design. But it doesn't prove nobody made it, OK? So arguing, for, arguing from poor design is not a good argument for evolution. But the eye is not poorly designed. I told this atheist I debated, I said, sir, listen, um, the humans live in the air, OK? Air is a very poor insulator for UV light. UV light will burn your retina. Now, so you have blood vessels in front of your retina to block out the UV light. Octopus live in the water, OK? Now, water blocks UV light. So they don't mind having their blood vessels behind the retina. They're designed for living in water, and you're designed for living in air. I said, if you want to swap eyes with an octopus, you just go ahead, but you're going to be blind in a few days, OK? It's not evidence for evolution. Don't give me this poor design of the human eyeball. And kids, if you go to college, you're going to hit a professor who'll tell you that. OK, they're either confused about their anatomy or they're lying to you. It's not poor design, OK? The textbook talks about how life evolved from non-living material. Uh, we could spend an hour on this one about how they did not use oxygen intentionally. We cover that on video four about the uh, origin of life experience. We're not going to talk about that tonight. This textbook says, gills are an adaptation to living in water. Well, how did they live before they adapted the gills? Well, you see, boys and girls, for millions of years, none of them lived. They all died <laughs> until they evolved the gills. Why don't they say it's a design feature? They don't want to say it's a design feature, because then come kids, some kid's going to say, who's the designer? They always use this word adapted. I heard it about six times tonight. These are adapted. These are adapted. No, they're designed for what they do, OK? This textbook says humans and orangutans are 96% similar in their DNA. So what? They say, well, that proves a common ancestor 15 million years ago. No, it doesn't. Actually, they, this textbook says, uh, Darwin speculated all forms of life are related. This speculation has been verified. That is baloney. Verified by DNA. The DNA is unbelievably complicated. One person's DNA, all the DNA out of your body would fill about two tablespoons. But if you tied them end to end and stretched them out, it'd reach from Earth to the moon and back five million round trips. Unbelievably complex. Didn't happen by chance. Okay. Then now they're telling the kids, like uh, Richard Goldschmidt said, clear back in 1940, the first bird hatched from a reptile egg. He, 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 he was frustrated because they couldn't find any evidence for evolution. You couldn't find any fossils that are missing links. He said, so it must have happened quickly because we don't find the evidence. This is silly, OK? In the mind of the evolutionist, there's only two choices. They'll say, evolution happened slowly, like Darwin said, or evolution happened quickly, like Gould said. They don't seem to be capable of thinking outside the box. It didn't happen at all. They don't want to think about that, OK? Um, this guy says, evolution is a fact. The evidence for evolution from the fossils. He said, the fossil record provides some of the strongest evidence that species evolved over time. That is silly. There is no fossil record. There is a bunch of fossils in the dirt, but it's not a fossil record. 
Don't let them pull that one over on you. All you find are bones in the dirt. You don't look back in the fossil record. Fossils only exist in the present. You put your interpretation on them, but they exist in the present. Everything else is your interpretation on there. See, the creationists and the evolutionists are both seeing the same evidence, coming to different conclusions. I look at fossils and see evidence of rapid burial and a flood. The evolutionists look at fossils and look for evidence for how they change from one thing to another. We don't see anything changing today like that. Why would you think it was different long ago and far away? Um, they say birds are descendants of dinosaurs. Well, you're welcome to believe that, but there are a few differences between a dinosaur and a bird, okay? You don't just put a few feathers on them and say, come on, give it a try, man. It won't hurt too bad. <laughs> it's just not quite that simple, okay? Textbook will say Archaeopteryx is evidence for evolution. Archaeopteryx is a bird, okay? Alan Fiducia, University of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, one of the world's experts on, he believes in evolution, but he says, Paleontologists have tried to turn Archaeopteryx to an earthbound feathered dinosaur, but it's not. It's a bird, a perching bird. And no amount of paleo babble is going to change that. Students believe evolution because that's what they've been taught. I think all that's been presented are lies. I think the lies ought to be taken out of the books, and then if you have evidence for your theory, show it to the kids. They tell them they're an animal. What's it do? <laughs> well, look around, okay? They act like animals. Now, <laughs> Teen suicide rate's gone crazy in this country. Violent crimes have gone up a thousand percent since evolution became the dominant theory in the early 60s. Unmarried couples living together in adultery has increased 725 percent. Premarital or a teen, pre, a teen uh, uh, premarital sex has gone up in every category. Um, Satan's a liar, folks. He wants to deceive you. And I think if somebody believes that we came from an ape-like ancestor or even came from an amoeba up to a human, they're welcome to believe that. But that's not science. It's not common sense. And I think they need to understand that teaching is going to destroy the faith of some kids in their class, which maybe they don't understand, maybe they do understand. But Jesus said, Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. So before I taught evolution to anybody, I'd take a long, hard look at Jesus' warning. I mean, if you don't believe he existed, don't believe he's God, that's fine. But listen carefully to his warning. You're in serious trouble. What should we do? Well. 75% of kids from Christian homes that go to public schools reject the faith after one year of college. After they're subjected to a whole semester or a whole year or four whole years of computer animations of how it might have happened, pretty soon they start to get confused and start to believe it. That's what happens to many of them. Scott wrote me a letter. He said, Dr. Oven, until I went to college, my faith in God was sound. But my college history class helped destroy that faith. Folks, evolution's not just in science class. It's in history, English, math, every class, okay? Scott said, I started to doubt the Bible and God's Word, even started to doubt Jesus was truly God's Son and that He died and rose from my sins. My best friend showed me your tapes and I was in awe of what I saw. Everything I thought, thought I knew about life was changed. Yeah, he rescued one. Charles Darwin, studied to be a preacher, lost his faith. Farrell Till, former Church of Christ missionary, now the editor of an atheist magazine. I debated him, debate number seven on the table. Tom, uh, Michael Shermer, editor of Skeptics Magazine, here in California, I debated him. Um, I don't know when that was. Claimed he was a Christian as a kid. Tom Hanks, stars in movies with little or no morals, claimed he was a Christian and loved the Lord when he was 16. Gary Parker, now teaching his back to a creationist. Michael Ruse, the main spokesman at the Arkansas trial, was raised in a Christian home, spoke out against creation. John Templeton, who used to work with Billy Graham, accepted evolution and wrote a book, Farewell to God. Frank Zindler, studied to be a Lutheran priest. He's the president of the Ohio Atheist Association. I debated him. And we're going to get Matt Rainbow off the list here by the end of the night. 